Guys, welcome back. We are here, Invest with Instinct, episode 12 now. I'm really excited for this one. I actually, well, a story as old as time, meeting another person on a Discord community through an NFT uh, an NFT group. But it's somebody that I've talked to for, man, it's probably going on a year now. Um, really learned a lot from this guy, and he's he's brought a lot of value to other people, whether it be on Discord, on Twitter, um, throughout the whole space. So really happy to have him on. Ravi, Ravi Monkey. I don't even I don't even know what people are calling you these days. Probably just Ravi. But as you can see, he's a cute little monkey with a mushroom on his head. So welcome to the podcast. Glad to be here. Looking forward to it. <laughs> so if you guys are interested in learning a little bit more about him, um, do your own research. I don't feel like going through his story. He's been around the game of investing and trading and NFTs and, and crypto a long time. He's got he's got a lot to say. And if you're really interested in getting to know him, go buy a monkey baby on Solana and you can come chat with us all the time. <laughs> but for now, I uh, got him for about an hour and we're going to run through some of the stuff we've chatted about and I first personally find very interesting. So Ravi, without further ado, you've always preached about having a trading plan of sorts. So I want you to dive into your opinion on what that is, what that entails, and how people can leave this conversation and kind of able to start processing their own. Sure. Now, when I first started investing, I did not have a trading plan. And that was during the late 90s, during the, y, during the uh, Y2K era year 2000 and what I, and the and a tech boom that was one of our earlier internet tech booms and i was up over a million dollars in my portfolio at that time you know young 22 23 year old all, <laughs> then all of a sudden i lost 95% of my portfolio <laughs> within a couple of months oh. and i quickly realized that um i need to have a plan because this was um I had generational wealth that I thought at that time, and I lost it all. So, uh, so I spoke to uh, a couple of savvy investors that did very well in that era, and that were able to sell at the right uh, moments, and um, and retired actually, some in their early thirties. So, mm. um, so that's that was my background and why I started creating an investment plan. Learn from pain. So my, my philosophy is very simple. Um, the first thing I did was I, I spoke to investors that I knew that did very well during that crash, that era. Then I also went and uh, took their advice, and they gave me a couple of names to look at. George Soros, Stan Druckenmiller, Warren Buffett um, spoke about how they approach investing and saying that, hey, there's many ways to be successful investing. There's not just one way, one size fits all, uh, which was something that I, I thought. I thought that, hey, um, you just pick winners. I was quite naive at the time. You just have to pick the right stocks, um, buy the right real estate or buy the right, ass, um, right asset. But it's not that case. So I had to create some sort of investment philosophy. I had that from conversations with others, successful investors. And then I did some research uh, looking at some of the top investors uh, during during that era and previous eras as well. Okay. Yep. Now now I started there. Then I create created a strategy because I looked at saying, okay, if I looked at wealthy individuals over time, what did they invest in? And I looked at, oh, um, two thirds of them had a very large real estate portfolio. Uh, some of them own stocks and bonds. Some of them did um, VC disruption. So I said, okay, that, that seems great to me because, you know, I came from the background where I put everything in dot-com stocks. <laughs> that was 100% risk, high disruption type of assets. So that was not, that not going to work well for me. Now, one of my friends who retired, he said, you know what? You have a good philosophy there. It's coming together, but what's your objectives? And be specific. And I asked him, well, what, what do you mean by that? He says his objective was to retire at age 35. Very specific. One of my other friends um, that retired says he wanted to have an annual income of 100K after taxes in today's dollars, 
um, at retirement. I had another one saying that, hey, he wants to leave an inheritance um, for his children. So that made me really start thinking, say, okay, what are my specific goals? What are they? Because that's going to align to um, how I invest. Then, um, then we talked about something called risk tolerance. And this is where I talk about the sleep at night test. Because when you invest in markets, there's uncertainties. And during the whole dot-com era when I was investing in these tech stocks, I had problems sleeping. And I, uh, and I noticed in my journals, I was having sleep for four or five hours. I was constantly checking prices. And I realized I was not thinking clearly um, for many days at a time. So, uh, I, so I quickly realized that I was probably taking on too much risk because constantly thinking about it. And um, it, it impacted my personality because my relationship with others were very poor during that time as well. I was very short and abrupt with them. So that so I put that in my plan. It was, well, risk tolerance. Then, then after I did all that, right, I, I have my philosophy um, approach, which is those three bucks I talked about. I have my objective, what my goals are. Um, I have my risk tolerance, which is that sleep at night test, right? This is very simple. I'm simplifying things. Then I started talking about, um, you know, asset allocation strategy because the great investors always have some strategy for um, uh, allocating assets. They would do real estate. They would do stocks, bonds. They would do a certain percentage of disruption. I had to figure out what my strategy was. When I was very young, mine was very simple. I didn't have much money. So I did 80% in disruption. And I, and I said, okay, I'll save a, a certain amount because I would like to buy an apartment or a house one day. So, put, you know, so that's, that's the way I looked at it. As I got older, um, I did you know, 40% real estate, 40% stocks and bonds, 20% disruption. So this strategy changes over time. Then after that, having that... Um, type of strategy in place, how am I, how am I gonna uh, allocate assets? Then I started talking to my friends. Um, again, these are the ones who retired successfully. I says, okay, think about your investment themes. And again, I'm, I'm asking, what, what do you mean by investment themes? Um, when they invested uh, in um, during that era, and I'll relate, relate it back to this era, they saw the internet as something that could go exponential or increase rapidly and um what they did was they made they they aligned their portfolio on things that could capture that value that if the internet does take off these are the areas that are going to do very well part of it is saying hey someone has to build a plumbing for the internet the routers the networks they saw a company like cisco say oh that company is gonna do fantastic someone has to build a software and they looked at um, Yahoo at the time. When, so that company knows what they're doing, right? Someone's going to win search, okay? And they, and they went and started creating a, a list, a conviction list. But again, their big theme was the internet is going to go uh, exponential. It's going to increase rapidly. And so one of the things I did was say, okay, I need to work on my investment theme, my big picture view. Because when everything else fails, I have to see if that view is still um, is still reliable. And this is where they had me do an exercise, put evidence for my views and evidence against. So I had to go and understand both sides, for the internet and against the internet. And there was a lot of um, views against the internet um, at that time. And... Um, and and that's what I did. So I started selecting investments, um, but I, I had a theme. Next thing was time horizon. I'm not a short-term trader. I don't look at charts weekly or technical analysis. I will look at technical analysis for an entry point if I'm if I'm buying a position to an asset. But my time horizon varies from one year to multiple years. And that's something that um, I think... Um, you, when I see a lot of confusion with um, with people buying and selling assets, they're using someone else's time horizon. They're usually using a short-term trader 
a long-term trader and they're confused because they they don't understand um the the different views or perceptions with those approach with those approaches okay so once i selected my investments i have my time horizon then there's something um what i've seen the really great traders do or investment managers they have a review process depending on um they really they review their pnl profits and losses it could be weekly monthly quarterly and annually and, and they just don't they don't review it alone i've noticed a lot of them have a trusted partner or an individual or a group that they review it with um and i asked them about that and they said you really can't do it alone because someone has to call your bullshit. Someone has to point out your blind spots. Typically, you do not see them. And then they do some sort of rebalancing after that. So, so that's what I um, look at as in terms of a, an, an, an investing or trading plan. It's just to have those things written down on paper because they will change over time as your knowledge improves. Pretty interesting, the idea of um, having people, trusted people, review things with you. That's something I haven't really done. A lot of people tend to keep things kind of close to the vest. Um, so is that is that just something over time you've kind of, those people have kind of fallen into place and you've, you've been op just open with them about like kind of being vulnerable about what it is your goals are, what it is you're invested in. And then you're like, I'm okay with you just giving me your opinion and taking that into account and moving on from there. Is that kind of how you approach it? Yeah, that's, that's how I approach it because I noticed in the, um, it, it, when I lost that um, bag in the year 2000 with that internet boom was I was working alone and I didn't see the blind spots. Yeah. I, I had so many at that time. Um, I was young, right? And I thought that I knew more, um, the, the more, um, and that, that relates to something that, um, Charlie Munger, I know I'm jumping on into a tangent here, mm -hmm. but one of the things that Charlie Munger said was you need to understand your circle of competence. You need to acknowledge what you know. Um, you need to know when to rely on experts or people who know more than you, and you don't need to be an expert on, on everything to make money. And uh, I learned that lesson the hard way, because it's 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 quite humbling uh, when you have to when you acknowledge and tell someone you don't know. Yeah. It's very hard to say. It was very hard for me to say um, at that time and in, in at that at that stage of my life. What do you think the the guys who you knew at the time who retired and they were successful during this kind of run up with the internet and all that? How were they able to not? fall victim to what was happening in that moment um how were they actually able to capture what they are was it because of their goals like i would have assumed they'd get caught up in the idea that they've they're going to become billionaires i mean they've found the one they were in at the bottom and and they could hold or whatever like how did they they and i'm sure they lost some back but how did they take advantage of that run without falling into the 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 huge crevasse that is like greed when, when it was happening, like, like you might've. Yeah. So what they did was um, they lost a massive bag during the long-term capital management. So long-term capital management, you could think of that as a, um, it was a fund of Nobel laureates, um, the best economists, traders, and they were making bets on currencies. And then we had the Russian ruble crisis. So both of these individuals were currency um, currency commodity traders. And um, they lost their jobs at the time <laughs> when they were making those bets following, and they blew up. Hmm. And they, they said that was um, a big lesson to them, that, hey, the brightest and smartest got this wrong. Hmm. And, how, and, and they went and reevaluated their um, risk tolerance and their frameworks. And 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 um, and approaches to things, because on on that trade they were up. They were up. Um, I think one of the, one of them told me they were up four or five hundred percent, but they did not. Um, uh, they did not. They did not take profits. And 
do you think <laughs> I, I'm, I'm like thinking it's analogous to like this previous crypto run to the top, you know, and everybody that was here for 2021 and 2022 and experienced the euphoria and the subsequent downfall. Um, you know, you learn a lot of lessons during that personally. And, you know, what I wonder is, it sounds like those guys, they learned from a crisis of their own, right? They, they learned from blowing up and then they were able to implement what they learned the next time it happened, even though they were probably feeling amazing and, and you know, they, they caught exactly what they were hoping for. What I wonder is if in crypto, if we do experience another euphoric run, if it happens, big if, will you use the lessons that you learned to then take advantage of, of your plan that you've been working on? That's something I wonder about. I try to put myself mentally into that position in the future. Um, you know, we both like Solana, right? Like I invested a decent amount in Solana and I like to think to myself, okay, Solana goes here. That's great. What do I do? You know, how do I not repeat the same mistakes? How do I listen to what I'm telling myself now when I'm clear headed? Um, what do you think about that? Do you think a lot of people have learned? A lot of people are going to keep making those same mistakes. Um, what's your opinion on that potential future there? I would say most have not. Uh, and the reason why is I did an ad hoc poll before I chat here, talking to some um, crypto investors, if they have a plan you know, for taking profits or what's your plan for this cycle. Most don't have a plan. So what happens is if you don't have a plan written down, your emotions will take charge. And, um, and what, what, one thing that I've learned in the last cycle is people do not sell. They, they, they do not lock in profits. And because um, they think, um, as you mentioned earlier, that, hey, this is going to go 10x more. This will go 5x more. Uh, because, you know, it's, uh, it's that optimism that, that, you know, that creeps in, saying that, hey, this is going to continue going, going until it doesn't. So that's where you really need to have a plan and, and, and a selling strategy. Because if again, if you look at the great investors, they know how to layer out. They know how to move out of a position. They know how to, they know how to um, um, take profits from a great trade. Yeah, it just seems like, you know, with with crypto, we have this attachment to it, this emotional attachment, as like a, we're young. We this is our thing. I can't. I can't sell because it's almost like admitting like it was all about the fiat anyway. You know, I, I want to stay a part of this and like stick it to the man. And, um, you know, I feel like those those great investors, although they might think an asset's great, they don't have some over stimulated attachment to the um, I don't know if you want to call it community ness of it. Does that sound yeah, about right? That's about right. But. You know, what Munger says, Charlie Munger, he says never fall in love with an investment. Mm -hmm. So there's a community aspect of crypto, which is great. You could fall in love with the community. However, falling in love with an investment, you got to separate the two. <laughs> um, and, and I think that's what's happened here. Some of these um, crypto communities are, are, are religious. <laughs> yeah. um, up only, right? We've heard that. Or saying that, hey, I'm not going to invest in anything else um, if it's not Solana or Ethereum or Bitcoin. They become maxis. And as soon as you become a maxi, you have a rigid point of view. Yeah. You don't see anything else outside of your ecosystem. And it's that um, it, it's that love of that investment. And, and, and I think that's what got people in the last cycle. Yeah, it's interesting though because I feel like some, it, almost during this bear market, a lot of it is only intensified. Like if you've if you've stuck around and really, you know, sat through this past year, you almost might be more dug in to where your money is now, right? Like, I mean, I yeah. think some people have learned otherwise, but some people are still so rude. I mean, NFTs is off the wall with that stuff, but even just coins itself. Yeah, and and what happens is people missed AI. They yeah. missed the whole AI um, run. 
-hmm. and it was right there staring at him. And these individuals are knowledgeable to understand that, but they they stayed in their um, particular ecosystem. Uh, they did not go and look at their at the themes, because a lot of them said, "Hey, we're here for disruptive technology." Uh, we felt left out of the markets. You know, the older generation has most of the money. We don't have much, and when the opportunity was there, they did not take it the, the, the past year. Yeah, it's almost, that's interesting. It's like you got blindsided by bick, bickering amongst each other in this, you know, overall small ecosystem compared to the world. Um, I mean, I even, I even felt prey to that. Not that I was like overly invested in spending my time in crypto, but like I have a decent amount of my money there and I just, you know, trading commodities and doing all this, that it was just, it was just like you said, it was, it was just kind of blazing right past me. Like, go ahead, take a look over here. No. Okay. Well, we're going to go do this fun thing and you're not going to be a part of it. Yeah. And that's where it's good to have some friends that are great investors as well. Cause one of my friends, um, you know, is a CIO, you know, works in Silicon Valley. And he, he mentioned to me, um, last year around this time saying this AI will take off. They finally cracked it. And um, I wasn't sure at the time. And he explained to me um, by showing me a, a, a large language model prompt. This was around November at this time last year. When I saw it in action and what it did, I thought it was going to be a simple chat bot where you type in a simple chat, respond back. But I didn't realize that I could make coherent sentences, write essays, solve uh, math homework problems as soon as i saw that and he showed it to me i said my response is what are we buying yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you know that's when i started you know buying you know you know semiconductor index uh, big tech that should capture that value but it didn't come from me it was from a friend that was showing me the disruption and then i based on my knowledge and experience i knew what the potential was and then i made a bet yeah, that's pretty great. That's the that's the power of the community right there. Um, that that's that's super powerful. I, I feel like, in a weird way, everything comes back to who you know and who you meet in life. You know, um, obviously, you can you can learn and do everything, kind of on a solo mission too. But the 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 exponential power of some people reaching out to you in a specific time like that can can change everything. You know, what's funny is like there's still so many people who haven't even done a prompt before. Like it's <laughs> mind boggling to me. Like, no, I, I was explaining to my, uh, mother-in-law the other day, I was like, Oh yeah, just use chat GPT. Let me know what it says. And she's like, what? Right. I'm like, yeah, chat GPT. Just go. It's like Google. You can, you know, whatever I had to walk her through. It's on openai.com. You can attach your Google to it. You can type it. It was amazing. I was like, I forgot that like, I'm in such an echo chamber myself that like, there's still 90 people out of 100 that haven't used this at all. Yeah, and and that's a disruption. And, and I've noticed that too in in the dot com era. You won't believe um, in the 1997 98, hardly anyone was on the internet until AOL made it simple, made it very easy for you to click on a button, and you're able to get on into that very easily. Yeah. Uh, and that before that, you had to go and do a lot of other things to make that happen. And um, there's just too much friction there, but that but that's where the opportunities are, and um, it is is to look at that, um, you know, where technology is going. I'll give you an example of uh, of one of my other friends who's questioning one of my theses, and um, we had this conversation a couple of weeks ago, and he's making me really think. So one of my investment themes is demographics. I said, hey, we have a large generation of retired baby boomers. These are individuals, you know, over 60 years or older. Uh, they're not going to be paying taxes to the system. There'll be less people paying taxes. It's going to have an impact on the way we invest. And my friend called me out saying, I don't think that's a problem anymore. I'm like, really? He says, yeah. So he walked me through this saying, you give me Amazon an example. So Amazon has 1.6 million workers in their fulfillment factories, but they have 750,000 robots. And recently they started piloting fulfillment robots. 
that is robots that can do the packaging and um the tagging and, and the on those things and he started making me thinking uh think about that hey robotics is moving so fast that all these things that people used to do they won't need not they won't be need to do from kiosks to fast food workers highly repetitive that's all going to be replaced now i thought that that was decades away but based on what he was showing me it's years away so now i have to go revisit my theme and and think about some of my investments but you see how dynamic the markets are and um and why you need to have those conversations um with people because you could be stuck in this um echo chamber very very easily so let me pull on that thread a little bit just to to go through your mindset here a little bit like you're having that conversation and somebody says says that right and it's like oh wow like this could be pulled forward quite a bit now when it comes to like the unemployment rate and things like that right like hey there's a lot of um jobs being displaced more people are maybe not going to have to work you got a lot of people retiring um how do you think like when you start to play out how things change how do you think that impacts how the unemployment rate affects markets or how maybe um some sort of like more stimulus has to come because less people are working but they're still consuming or like how does that then affect your investments do you start playing all those scenarios out through your head and chatting with people yeah so that's what i'm doing right now is saying okay if um, the key is the rate of change, right? What I mean by that is, what's the rate of change of the, the unemployment rate going to be with this type of disruption? Can it be absorbed? Or what are the new jobs will be created? Because when, when the internet was booming, we thought that we we're going to have a massive problems with unemployment because it's going to automate so many things. We thought, but you know what? It creates so many different uh, opportunities that we didn't think that was possible at the time, especially along the lines of data centers, network engineers, create a ton of opportunities for computer scientists, for individuals to build software. For AI, the question is, what type of opportunity is it going to create for, um, for individuals? So if everyone has their own little mini AI, that can do a lot of mundane tasks for them, allow them to focus on things that are more creative, um, what type of opportunities will that create? Mm -hmm. You know, because that's gonna be a massive productivity boost for that individual. Do we have more micro businesses, smaller businesses? Uh, I just wrote down arts yeah. and creativity and entrepreneurship. That's exactly, <laughs> you went right down the same road there. Yeah. Exactly, because when I was in the, uh, give you, some perspective here. In the late 90s, if you had to go and start a, a business, specifically a tech business, it was at least $10 million because of data center costs, um, equipment. Now with um, Google services, AWS, Amazon Web Services, it's thousands of dollars. So look at that opportunity that I created for entrepreneurs. Um, AI, is hey i need to hire all these experts to create this product but with ai ai is that expert where you may not have to hire 10 you may have to hire two just to get a prototype out so so from my perspective is you you have you have both disruption in let's say um repetitive type of jobs jobs that are like factory oriented where someone working on an assembly line still versus all that creativity that's going to be unleashed. The key is what's the rate of change, the net um, hmm. impact on, on unemployment. I don't have the answer. That's what I'm trying to figure out. But at least I'm having the conversation. I'm not blind by it. <laughs> yeah, I, no, I think it's great. Because I then I think like, let's say that rate of change just increases drastically. My first instinct was to say quality of life goes up. You know, um, this nine to five demon work uh starts to crisscross with creativity entrepreneurship doing things that you're more passionate about your fulfillment goes up quality of life 
relationships and then maybe even like life expectancy. And then I'm like life expectancy. That means healthcare is probably, you know, the last, uh, maybe, maybe healthcare is an interesting field because you're going to be alive longer, but not necessarily healthier, just maybe happier. And, uh, what are the improvements in the health field with AI and things like, I just like, it always gets your mind running and you can really come to some interesting points. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, you want to be directionally aligned to change where there, where, where the change is going. I know there's a lot of fear around it. Um, but if you look at the major technology waves, yes, there were, there were areas and fields impacted from the early days of textiles to what we saw with the factories, especially with automation and factories. But then you, you create opportunities for individuals to, you know, to go fix the robots in the factories, as an example, or for um, these software engineers to go and um, work on the software project of their choice as well. So th there was a lot of opportunities created with these uh, waves of disruption. But you want to be aligned with the di disruption. You don't, you don't want to fight it. So what makes you, it's a little like when I think of this stuff it, and, and my, my initial fear instinct is, well, why can't we just have another tech blow up again in which we all got so hyped up about this stuff that it all comes crashing down before it actually, um, kind of like S curves into society or whatever. How do you get past that? idea and stay optimistic about throwing money into these disruptive technologies is it is it because you have a long-term time horizon and it's only a certain part of your portfolio so it goes back to your plan that way you can actually ride out the success of these things and you're not 100 percent depending on like some teledoc or ai something to to be the one that works is that what makes you a little more comfortable approaching disruption this way yeah, so when I look at disruption, I look at it from a three three to five year bucket where I don't expect much. What I mean by that is it takes time for it to work out. And what I typically do is I, t I look and see who are going to be the winners. Right? So, for example, when I looked at AI and, and I was working it out, I said, okay, Microsoft's going to be a winner. Um, Facebook will be a winner. They need chips, so NVIDIA, maybe AMD. So I was writing a list down, and then I then I made some you know small bets. Now, as I mentioned earlier, forty percent of my assets in real estate, forty percent are in stocks and bonds, and then there's twenty percent disruption. That is risky things. And that twenty percent I write off to zero. <laughs> I assume that it's going to go to zero. So um, that's my assumption. Uh, because it's very high risk when I um, when I make investments here. Disruption could be crypto. There could be specific robotic companies. It could be um, specific AI companies. Now, if I want to play it safer, saying, hey, um, I want to go with the trend or capture some of that trend, well, then you look at specific ETFs, exchange, exchange traded funds, saying, I know big tech is going to do well with AI. I don't have the assets or um, right. or I, I don't really want to go and, you know, pick individual stocks. And I'll buy an ETF, the NASDAQ 100 Trust, saying, okay, I'll just buy the NASDAQ 100 Trust. Let it sit for three to five years. I know it's going to capture some of that value as, a, as an example, right? So there's many ways to play this based on your risk tolerance. Right? Um, the idea of something going to zero is really um impactful to people and i think the main reason why is it's a large portion of the portfolio but if it's one percent of the portfolio right if you have a portfolio of hundred thousand and you put that one thousand in on something that could go to zero yeah it'll hurt but it won't be as impactful mm -hmm. what are um what are the reasons you think that tech and like you know these big guys like the things that have been doing really well for a long time, what makes you think they're going to be able to continue doing as well or better moving forward? Is it their ability to adapt and incorporate these disruptive technologies within them already because they're so big and they can just buy up 
startups and things like that? How do you, why do you still expect them to do so well? Well, I, I go and look and see um, their leadership, their vision and their approach because of, to see if it's aligned with my themes. One of the mistakes I made early on was with Microsoft. So I, I bought Microsoft in the early 90s. I did not understand why people were, were selling the stock aggressively in the, in the late 90s. And until I, I spoke to some others a little bit too late, saying, oh, the regulators are coming after them, antitrust. And um, as a result, many people sold off that stock. and And also they did not align with my friend's themes on the internet. Um, if you remember Microsoft, um, Bill Gates at the time said, oh, the internet's nothing. They were very late to the game. Mm. Uh, they eventually pivoted and made the right calls, but um, they, they, they missed out on four or five years of, um, uh, of upside when, the, when this was happening. Now, obviously Microsoft is doing extremely well, but these companies uh, may stray off and go in the wrong direction. Uh, so you got to see if they're, that's why you need to have your own big picture themes. Mm -hmm. And then I take a look at my big picture, picture themes and see if those companies are still aligned with those big picture themes. So what is your highest conviction when it comes to disruption moving forward? Um, you know, you got crypto, you got AI, you got robotics, you got space, you got all these things. What gets you out of bed most in the morning? What do you think people are missing the most? Um, what, what's rushing to us rate of change wise faster than we could have thought? I, I would say um, both crypto and AI. And and, and the reason why I say uh, I see crypto is I'm seeing actual governments using um, crypto technology, right? And um, and that tells me that the adoption is there. I look at China and how they created a social credit system and how they're enforcing it with um, crypto technology. I've looked at other countries on their, their plans for virtual currencies is, is based on crypto technology. So the underlying technology is, is finding a a market fit, right? That market fit is 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 basically um, payments, global payments, right? So yes, it'll take some time, but I see that happening, right? Now AI, AI has um, unlimited potential. As I mentioned, that example with um, with Amazon and those robots. Now AI is being used to help train those robots. In the past, it would require a lot of um, trial and error to train these robots. Now, with um, AIs, you could be working on training the robots and seeing what the outcomes are um, 10x or 100x faster. That's just one example of it and, uh, and the productivity gains. I spoke to some friends who are software engineers, software uh, developers, and I asked them about the productivity of um, AI for, you know, writing code. And they said that the part of their jobs that they're, they're horrible at, which is writing test cases, documentation, AI has made that a lot easier for them. Hmm. So I said, okay, what's that productivity impact for you? And for the software engineers, again, these are what I call some of the brightest engineers. For them, we see an instant 20, 30% improvement in their productivity. Hmm. So that's impactful. And, um, and when you multiply that out across, you know, millions of engineers, the, the impact is going to be, uh, is going to be felt. So, so that, that's why I picked those, um, those two areas. The other thing is with crypto and, um, the technology itself is we're moving into an era with deep fakes. That is, you could generate content. How do you know something is real? How do you know someone's identity is real? Someone calls you on the phone. How do you know if that's a real person? Or, or someone else on the other line. Those are all the questions that we're going to have to figure out. And we need crypt cryptography and crypto to help with that because it's, it's unleashed. That's going to be there. It's going to happen. Do you think that regulatorily speaking, we have 
cross the chasm in crypto? And do you think the globalness of crypto is kind of impacting that and pushing things forward just because of like the game theory of it? Yeah, definitely. Because um, if, if you look at um, innovation and the countries that have adopted innovation, I'll give you a classic example. I look at the Eurozone and and I saw what they did with tech startups in the early 2000s, late 2000s. They made it very difficult with the number of regulations that they have for tech, for tech startups to, um, to raise funds and just to be within those um, countries. So what happened? They, um, these startups went to Singapore, to the U.S., they went to other uh, hubs. And if you look at uh, unicorns or billion dollar um, startups, tech startups in the Eurozone, there's not too many. Yeah. So you don't want to make that mistake again. And it, and it almost could seem like um, America is the one making that mistake this time, it feels like. Yeah, we are. Um, but if I look at Silicon Valley, it's still very strong in the U.S., and I think um, I was surprised. I thought that there would be more of them leaving. But I guess when people make a home somewhere, and, yeah. um, it's very hard for them to move. But it's been impactful for the U.S., especially uh, the shift to Asia, especially to Singapore, um, Korea, and Japan. Uh, the, I, I see them capturing more value. But it's, it's, such, it's so early. We're still so early, though. If you look at it, yeah. global, global markets are, you know, was it 200 trillion? I don't remember the exact number. Crypto is a little over 1 trillion. So you're talking about, you know, 0.5%. It's, it's, uh, it's a rounding yeah. error. It's just, you know, it's for people, there's so many of the crypto people are young. And for us not having lived through some of these times, like the internet, you know, we were all pretty young uh, during those times, not paying attention and with the uh, the theme of the world these days of instant, you know, wanting things quickly, um, it's hard to not think sometimes after a year of, of more than a year of things going down only, it's hard to see the light at the end of the tunnel. It's hard to think about a $10 trillion industry, you know? Um, and like having that conviction and having the foresight and having it all be within your plan is going to make it easier to see it through without caving in a sense, just when things can seem at its worst. Because like I said, I, I really feel like we're turning a corner here um, when it comes to the adoption, at least domestically here in the U S. Um, so uh, yeah, sometimes it's just difficult to have that conviction last through. Yeah, and, and, and that's why you have to have those big picture themes saying, has anything changed with those themes? And then you talk through it with others who, who have more expertise or who or whose expertise you trust. Yeah. And and that's what it comes down to. Um obviously you, you do want to avoid you do want to avoid those big mistakes. Um, but if you focus on 2021 and just looked at that particular year, you're gonna think that crypto was over. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Right. Or 20, what was it? 2017 there for a minute. Yeah. Um, yeah. Sometimes it just feels like hard to repeat after you've seen some of those parabolic things. Like how could that really happen again? But who knows? I, I, I don't know. Um, okay. So, you know, with, with crypto, with the internet, with all these things you can invest in and it's really easy to do it and the deep fakes and all this information just getting, blown into our face and into our ears all day every day um how is it that you best navigate through that jungle and uh how do you keep your head kind of aligned with with your vision and where you're going and how do you dilute some of that noise um along the way less is more so i filter content aggressively i think this morning i must have muted 20 twitter accounts <laughs> that was just too much for my timeline and there's too much inaccurate information as well so what i do is i i put my i, I create a circle right I, I go through this exercise once a year i have I, I i look at the good decision makers that i'm surrounded with 
you know, people in my, um, in my circle and whose, whose opinion that I trust because of their track record and the advice they've given me in the past. And I, I go and see, okay, is there anything changing with that circle? Because I, I need to, because right now we have too much information. I feel, like, I, I feel like it's information overload. I also have days, at least one day a week, where I disconnect from everything digitally. I take long walks, go on a nice long hike, and, uh, and I think and I journal without even looking at any pieces of information or content. And, I, and, I, and it's, it's my time to reflect, be creative, um, write down some ideas, and, um, and then I review that you know, um, every couple of months to see um, where my head and my thinking is at. But I think um, if I, my, my advice is just filter content aggressively because um, the information is so inaccurate in the media, on Twitter, even the Wall Street Journal. I was reading some of their articles um, and pieces recently, and um, the inaccuracies are, are uh, it's just, I'm just wondering who are these editors? <laughs> yeah. So in an essence, it's funny. I was talking about this with somebody else where like, you know, to, to become competent, like you do have to like add all these things to your arsenal. You have to practice, you have to study, you have to take in a lot of information. You have to execute, you have to keep, keep, you know, fixing things and plugging leaks and all this stuff. But I feel like once you get to that, like once you're confident, you have your plan, you have your convictions, it's all about like stripping the peels off the onion and really like simplifying things like sharpening the sword down to where you don't have the noise, you don't have the extra distractions and you, and you really focus on that single blade and trying to like really hone in on that. And it seems like you have a good process of doing that by, you know, checking in with yourself every so often, even as simply as just a weekly walk. Yeah. And, and one of the things that, again, I'm going back to Charlie Munger, and he looks at things as having uh, mental models or uh, these heuristics or these ways of making decisions. You've heard, everyone's heard Elon say first principle thinking. I mentioned, I mentioned circle of competence. Um, there's so, Occam's razor, which is probably overused. Um, there's so many different um, models out there. And when you're stuck, um, one advice I've gotten is yes, throw some of your mental models at it, because these mental models help shift your perspective, hmm. and and the way you think about things, and it's very it's very good to um, understand what models you use to make these decisions, because if not, then you're going to be making um, decisions based on your gut, <laughs> um, and and that can be dangerous. Hmm. All right. A couple more things for you, then we're going to let you go. What do you think outperforms the most in the next three years, two to three years? What um, basket, crypto, AI, wh wherever you want to go with that. Maybe it's something I'm not thinking about. Um, okay. Maybe it's real estate. I mean, at this rate, re our homes could be worth 10x in five <laughs> years. Who knows? Well, how about this? I, look at, I like to look at things as probabilities. Because based on where, where we go. No, we so, need exact answers, Ravi. No probability. <laughs> All right. So if I had to make a bet right now, I would say uh, there'll be a lot of capture uh, with crypto, especially for the next, um, next two years, next two to three years, adoption. And the reason why I say that is um, this ETF, um, that um, this Bitcoin ETF, that's been delayed for the last you know four or five years looks like it may get approved now why is that impactful um when i look at investors investors do not like friction 95 percent of investors i spoke with spoke to will not go create a coinbase account they're already on schwab or fidelity they're not going to go create another account they just don't want to that's one thing so if you have an ETF, you could buy from any of these um, existing um, brokerage accounts you have access to. I don't know any person in their 50s, 60s that will set up a crypto wallet. Yep. I went through this exercise with 30 or 40 family, friends, relatives, no one. Yep. So th with this passage of an ETF, but if I asked them, would you buy Bitcoins? 
it's not if it was an ETF or a fund, I'd buy it. <laughs> that that was their, you know, that that was their response. Okay. Um, so that's crypto. AI. When I look at um Amazon piloting these ro- robots, I see what um McDonald's is doing with robots as well, and all these other vendors. And it's because of the cost, the the overall cost optimization that they they're faced with. And um I I see that robotics, robotics, AI, big tech, big tech that's aligned to AI um will capture it. What I mean by big tech aligned to AI, Microsoft. Um, just to give you some examples. So um for data centers, 87% of data centers are still private, run by companies. Hmm. That's a big cost. They're going to go move to Microsoft, Amazon, um, Google, because they could do it a lot cheaper. Because hmm. the cost of um, storing data, um, compute, is getting, more, is getting more expensive for them. But for Microsoft, Amazon, they, um, they have the scale. And they could go and offer a very uh, great price point. So they're going to capture a lot of values there. Right? So um, I, we're still very early in cloud adoption as well. Hmm. So I, I, see, I see big tech getting bigger. Now, what, what can change this? What can kill this um, view? Well, if you have a commodity boom cycle, what I mean by that is oil goes to 200. Some events happen. Um, we have to go create redundant supply chains a lot quicker. Then I would look at um, manufacturing, logistic type companies that are uh, that are um, that will will be at the heart of supply chains because we learned that lesson in in COVID when you shut down the supply chains, you can't get products. Now, if that becomes a national security issue for more countries, where they're saying that hey, we need to build these supply chains. And I see them taking action. We saw that here with the infrastructure bill that was passed in the U.S. a couple of years ago, and there was six hundred billion dollars invested in chips, chip makers, because semiconductors and chips are part of everything we uh, need in the digital world. So if I see investment of that type being spent um, from different countries, then I will shift as well. So. I just want to give a couple different um, angles here you yeah. can look at. It's interesting though, is like all re- all roads eventually kind of lead back to to your investment theory, right? Because like the more threats we have to commodity uh, disruption and supply chains and all that, the more well, the more they want to protect against that, the more they have to spend towards that, and. Uh, it kind of ends up seemingly leading towards technology in a way just might, you might have to go through a commodity super cycle in the beforehand, but I guess and, that's a big argument these days, right? Which one's well, gonna... <laughs> and, and if you look at the history, these commodity super cycles happen every 30 years, mm-hmm. you know, thir- and they have, and they, when they last for about five or seven years. Mm. So um, who knows um, if we're going to see something like that, but that's something to be wary of. Yeah, it's interesting. Okay, so Ravi, what are what's one or two of the you know the biggest lessons you've kind of taken away from this life that you've lived, and uh, you know what are the most important things that you've taken away from it, and then uh, you can get out of here. And go All right. On I think the most important lesson was um, you can't do it alone. There were so many things in my life as a teenager, as a kid growing in New York City, that I think that hey, I could. I'm an individual. I could do all this alone, and um, and we really can't. Definitely need to have someone, accountability partner, someone to really point out your blind spots. And um, and I, I think that's a very important lesson um, that I had to internalize and learn. the The second thing is figure out what your path is. There's many different paths you can take that that can make you a successful person. But figure out what that path is. Make it visible. Explain that path. Show someone that path. I think it's very important to to do that. Um, Because I see many people keep that in their heads. 
And if you keep something in your head, it becomes blurry over time. Hmm. So you're telling us you have a beautiful vision board at home? <laughs> I have a nice vision board. I have my investment plan. Um, and, and I look at those things. Mm -hmm. And I share them. I talk through them with, with, with others. Because I learned, too, by me sharing it and talking with others, um, people question it. Mm. <laughs> Say, why would you do that? And then sometimes they have, they have a good reason behind it. But if it's only known to me and in my head, um, how can I get help with it? And it forces you to uh, really be able to explain your case, right? But yeah. It, uh, and if you don't really have the ability to explain your case, it's like, how well do you really know it? Exactly. Hmm. Cool. Those are awesome. Uh, Robbie, this was really, really great for me. It's going to be really good for a lot of other people. So thanks for taking some time. And uh, if people want to get in touch with you, uh, best way, what? Twitter? X? Uh x yeah at ravi monkey or buy a mbb and yeah, uh join the best one right there <laughs> it's still the best value on solana it's hard to argue that all right thank you and um you have a wonderful